We continue the Shi'ur in Gibra. Gibra says that a person should always sully, always pray, and a person should never give up hope. Even if to continue to pray and to do Tishubah. The event shows how this means even in the worst instances possible. For example, a person becomes very ill and it is obvious that he is about to die. The people surrounding him are required to say to him, confess your sins. He goes to the Mishnah says, Sanhedrin, all those who are about to die, or they put to death by the Sanhedrin, should confess first, so that they can go to Alam Haba with a clear record. One who confesses his sins is forgiven. The Rashem Kadosh said that a person who has very serious sins and these sins are engraved into the person's bones, the person can die from the illness caused by this engraving itself, actually physically. There's a sickness called Shavidat at Samut, where a person's bones become very brittle, they break. We know that medically we know it's due to a lack of vitamin D. And in this case, it's caused by sins that are committed, and this engraving of these sins in the bones cannot come out. The bones cannot release this engraving or this brittleness except through vidui, through confession. Confession, of course, should be said in front of a tzaddik. Yet, when a person is about to die, confession in front of other people present is sufficient to have these sins pardoned. So if a person is at that stage where death is imminent, then he should confess. But before getting to that stage, he then says that a person should fear the worst. A person becomes ill. He walks outside and he is, there's nothing wrong yet. He should consider himself as though he has been handed over to the court official to be brought before a judge to be tried. In other words, he's in danger. Then, if he suddenly feels a head pain, a slight feeling of illness, he should consider himself as though he's been put in chains, going before the judge on the charges of a serious felony. If he has reached the point where he's bedded through illness, then he should consider himself as though he has been sentenced to the gallows. And at that time, a person is ill. What really takes place is that there is a trial in heaven. The Zohar Kadosh says a person who is sick is tried in heaven, and it is decided in heaven whether the sickness should become more serious, has a shallow fatal, or he should be cured. Now, then, the person has lawyers who speak on his behalf. Who are these lawyers? These lawyers are Tishuba, above all, that's the greatest lawyer of all, Tishuba repentance, and mitzvot. The person who does mitzvot, every mitzvah acts as a lawyer. Now, ordinarily, as we've learned many times, that for every mitzvah that a person does, there is an angel created. This angel, aside from the fact that he comes in handy in Alam Haba to serve him in Ganeden, but above all, this angel acts as his defense counsel in the heavenly court after a person passes away. If a person commits a sin, then on the contrary, the angel acts as an attorney against him to charge him with his crime. Now the Yemeda tells us that not only does this occur after a person passes away, but even during his lifetime. Every time that he is in a circumstance which is dangerous, which could become serious or even fatal, there is a trial in heaven at which these angels appear to testify for and against him. 
So the witness says, what chance does this man have at this trial? Here we find a pasuk in Eov, where the pasuk says, Im yesh alav malach melitz echad mini elef v'da'ehu v'redet if there is one angel out of a thousand who will speak well on behalf of this person, then the decision is this person is redeemed from death. Which means, mathematically, this man has 999 angels who charge him with a crime and who demand penalty for it, who demand even death. If he has one single mitzvah, one angel who stands there to argue on his behalf, he is saved. So powerful is the good compared to the bad. Rabbi Eliezer says, I say more than that. Is a greater mathematical, more delicate mathematical figure. If the person has 999 angels arguing against him, and that one out of a thousand that remains, in that one out of a thousand, there are 999 thousandths percentage points against him, and one thousandth of that one is for him, he too is saved. How can you have one angel, that's one single angel, one act, and that one angel is made up of a thousand parts, and 999 parts of it are evil, and 1,000 percent is good. This is a question that the Mephane Shimli commentaries ask. First, how it's possible. Secondly, how is it possible that that 1,000th of a percent, which means actually one millionth, because if you have a thousand angels, and a thousandth of one, that means one millionth percent, can save this person. How could that one millionth percent be so powerful? Now, these two questions are asked by the leading Mephadashim. Again, the first question is, why should this one thousandth of one angel, plus the other 999 being against him, why should he win out? And secondly, how is it possible, how do we explain such an act, where one single act, one angel created, that angel, 999 thousandths of that angel is evil, and one one thousandth of the angel is good? The answer is two major points, and both of them are important lessons. First, how is this possible? Very simple. Here we have the case of an Asha, an evil person who has performed 1,000 acts in the recent period before his illness, which caused him to become ill. These 1,000 acts, 999, were decidedly wrong acts, misdeeds, transgressions, crimes. There's no question about it that those 999 angels are solid black. Shachwat. He had one act, though, which was evil. But there was one tiny element involved, where in that act, he might have had a good thought or a good intention, an evil act with a slightly good intention, so small that it disappears. You cannot see anything that's one thousandth of an item. Any item you take divided into a thousand parts, that one thousandth is invisible. It cannot be seen anymore. And yet, and yet, this one thousandth can overpower the others. Why? In general, why? How come this good has such power? The answer is that the good angel is called a melitz yosher. Melitz means a lawyer who speaks with eloquence. The power of goodness, these angels that are created by good deeds, by mitzvot, have the power of dibur, of speech, that is so eloquent and so impressive and can penetrate into the hearts of the judges, heavenly judge, or the, the hearts of those who decide. In some cases, it's in the Shamot of Tzadikim. They speak with power. In this case, you have an angel who, this part of the angel, this tiny point, a pinpoint, who cannot be seen, who can hardly be heard, He's got to overpower the other 999% of this one unit, plus battle against the rest. 
how does he do it what is his trick his trick is to stress first the evil parts to show how black and how dark the shoot of this person is he says we confess we admit this person committed 999 purely evil acts and this one act we admit too here's a person who was so bad at Asha that he did one act that had this and this 999 parts that were bad imagine then he says how this one drop of goodness should not be hidden in a place that's so black and so dark you take a room that's a thousand square feet and in the center light a tiny candle and you'll have a large section of that room light up one little drop of light an inch or a fraction of an inch can penetrate a thousand fold a million fold area of darkness by stressing the person's evil first he shows then that if within such evil there can be a a good spark this person deserves to be saved this good spark would be invisible would would not count would be considered perhaps even a sin if done by a tzaddik but here we have it a does something like this in ratio relatively his act the spark is worth more than many of the good acts of a tzaddik and this is what the Gemara says of the arguments of the angels in heaven Benazel stresses this point very strongly Benazel says that a person many times could feel depressed himself he takes an account of himself of what he has done his record how bad it is he finds that he has not done mitzvot as he should he has not studied Torah he has not given charity he has not participated in communal activities for Israel, for the poor for mitzvot and then he says well I do go to Knis I do put on tefillin every day I put on tefillin today that's a tremendous mitzvah and then when he thinks more carefully about it he says I put on tefillin I didn't even think of what I was doing the tefillin I put on I disgraced them because this is something that's so holy it's called a crown of Hashem I put it on without Kavana I said sacred words of tefillah I mentioned Hashem's name that is so holy that angels in heaven tremble before they can say it they've got to say many words of holiness before they are allowed to omit emit the name of Hashem and here I said the name of Hashem so many times with tefillah without thinking without Kavana without considering the holiness of it what good is this mitzvah that I did I don't see mitzvah there I see it as a sin has a shalom the person can become more depressed even by the so-called good act that he has done and it also says that this is the wrong attitude of a person don't be the evil angel against yourself be the good angel search yourself not for the bad but look deeply and continue to search you'll find darkness you'll find more darkness you'll find bad intentions bad covenant nothing good if you search deeply enough you'll find a spark of good there is a little drop a dot that you'll find of pure goodness all that you've done and if you concentrate on this one dot you'll pull yourself up by this through that pit of darkness into a new realm of light this is called Dan Lekav Schut it's a to judge a person who has done something judge him to the good you judge him to the good it's a tremendous mitzvah it's just as big a mitzvah to judge yourself Lekav Schut because if you judge yourself with Kav Schut, you'll find that you are no longer a Rasha as you thought. Behold, you are a Tzaddik. With this, you'll drag yourself out of this depressive state of mind into a state of Simcha. And with this Simcha, you will become a Tzaddik. The result is that you, by your judging yourself this way, you become a Tzaddik. This is what the Bainal says, the main lesson of this Gemara, that the one percent one thousandth of a percent should be your own judgment you yourself should find the good within yourself and with that attach yourself to that good and then broaden it add to it you'll find that eventually shortly your the evil will fall away and you remain pure you'll be ole continually you'll rise up into higher what they got
Speaking about the power of the tongue, we know that Hashem created four different levels of creation. Lowest level is something that is inanimate, does not live at all. Earth, metal, mineral. Second level is something that is alive, but is immobile. It cannot move. That is vegetation. Third level, next to the highest, is chai, which means animal life, bird life, fish, things that live, move about, roam about. They have a degree of, of intelligence. But the highest one, the highest level of creation is midabe, which means the human being whose intellect, mentality is higher than the animal life, who possesses a soul, which animals don't, and in this, they are the highest level of creation. Yet, how does the Torah refer to this highest level? What term is used? Midabir. One who speaks. Not one who has a neshama, not one who has a brain, a moach, but a midabir, he speaks. With this power of speech, he is above animal life. It shows the greatness, the importance of the power of speech. It's understood that with speech, speaking, you can learn Torah, you can sully, you can speak words of holiness. Therefore, this is something that no other part of creation can perform. At the same time, the Yemeda warns that the power of speech is very harmful too. Very destructive. We know that one of the worst sins that exist is the sin of Ashon Hara, slander, speaking evilly about a person, by the Jew especially. The Yemen tells us that in addition, there is also a sinful act that is performed by the tongue that is so bad that the worst decrees, the harshest gizayot in heaven, come down, descend because of this act. This is called nivul peh. Nivul peh means profanity or unclean type of uh, verbiage. And the Yemenis says that the penalty for this, because it brings the anger of Hashem, which results in death, the Pasuk says, the words of the prophets, that orphans widows are brought about by this and then they in turn scream for help they are not answered from heaven and after all this the hand of justice is still stretched out to mete out penalties for it the Yemen says what is meant by this hand of justice stretched out in other words this must be and also that means there's an additional sin uh, that of evil pet. What is this sin that is so serious? Which case is this where the the justice in heaven is so incensed that it pursues the person endlessly? The even is the case of a wedding. The wedding we find at times when people come and instead of regarding it as a mitzvah, as an item of holiness, where there is a unity of two people, what is a wedding? A wedding is something that has been preordained in heaven. It was decided in heaven years before, before these two even came to earth, before they were born. This chatan and kala, bride and groom, as souls in heaven were united and they were divided in heaven sent down as two separate individuals but they were not two separate individuals they were actually half of an organism each one was one half one half of a complete neshama until these two met and were fused together by this they were merged in this chuppah they were considered half of a person. A man who was unmarried is called plaguf, half of a person. 
Same thing holds true with the woman because she too possesses only half of a soul. When they are married, they become Adam, complete person, complete organism. Now, the purpose of a wedding is that this soul should become complete, which means that a wedding is attended by the heavenly forces too. This is a simcha in heaven. If the wedding is considered sacred, if these two are united sacredly in Kiddushah, that's why it's called Kiddushin. Hariyat Mikudeshet, Lee the man says to the, the bridegroom says to the bride, Mikudeshet means, comes from the, the origin of the word Kodesh, holy. The entire thing should be considered something that is holy. These two being united, merged together, with the purpose of further producing the uh, future generation, a subsequent generation, this is the purpose of creation, the world, to propagate the breed, to bring more Kedusha into the world. Every child that is born means that many more prayers being said, that many more mitzvot being done. So in this case, of course, the wedding should be regarded as something that is Kodesh. But everyone knows the result of the wedding night, what the wedding night leads up to. The mating of the bride and groom, the Kedusha. Yet there are people who would deign, who would dare to speak about this in mocking or in jest in a form of profanity, meaning Nibble with unclean taint to their words. And those who speak about this at the time of the wedding, even if this person even this person that has already been fated in heaven to a rich life, full life of 70 years, then this, his fate is destroyed, that decision in heaven is destroyed, and everything in heaven is turned against him. This is what's meant by the Od Yadon the a hand of justice is stretched out to destroy this person's previous fate, and to give him a new hash decree for the future. So serious is the sin of Nibel Peh, of defaming and defiling an organ that is a person is blessed with, and which he is called a Midaben. He is above an animal because of the fact that he has a tongue, a mouth, a power of speech. Therefore, the event stresses that a person who is blessed being a person should live as one above the category of animal by guarding his tongue and seeing that only words of Kiddusha come from them. A person who guards his tongue can be assured then that the angels that it's thought created by his actions and by his words will then have a much stronger power of tongue to speak, to argue on his behalf in the heavenly court for him. Story of Rabbi Shimon by Yochai Zal. We're all acquainted with that story. We have it before like Mahomet. The story of how Rabbi Shimon by Yochai Zal became so famous and so great. There are a few details, though, that require a little more understanding. The story in itself we won't go through now just to point out some of these additional items. The, the beginning of the story was that Rabbi Shuma Bayechai was sitting in a room together with Rabbi Yehuda and Rabbi Yossi and they were discussing the architecture and culture of the Romans. Rabbi Yehuda praised them and Rabbi Yossi remained silent. Rabbi Shmuel Bayechai Zal attacked them. He said that their architecture and all their accomplishments were ones of evil directed at harming the Jews. And the Yemenis says that there was a man called Yehuda ben Gedim. 
who heard this and spoke, mentioned this, these words to his relatives, to his friends, and one mouth to the next, word got back to the king, and then the king sent soldiers to capture Rabbi Shulay Chayzal to kill him. He escaped. He hid out in a cave in the city of village of Pekin, where he stayed for 12 years, and then an additional year, 13 years, finally he came out. When he came back, the during those years, the first thing that happened was that when he came to this cave, a miracle happened, and in front of the cave, a well sprang up, a well of water from which he drank. He was there with his son, Rabbi Elazab, Rabbi Shumay Chayzal, and also a carob tree, buxa tree. From this they lived. Now they had food, this, this buxa and water, but they had no means of clothing. Where to get clothing from? How was clothing going to last so many years? The Yemena says that there was they, there was sand there and they dug a pit of this sand. They removed their clothing, covered themselves with sand. This way they preserved the clothing where it could last so many years. Then when they had to sell it or when necessary to get out, they would don these clothes again. So that's how the clothes lasted. As far as the food goes, why was the only food available this carob tree, Harub? This is because it was a miracle within a miracle. There was no carob tree there before. Now a tree sprang up. Not only was it a tree that sprang up, but a tree which ordinarily, even when planted, would take 70 years before it could produce fruit. And here it produced fruit immediately. So this was a nes betoch nes, a double miracle. When they came back, Rabbi Shulamai Chayazal's father-in-law, we stressed that word very much, because this is a, a major item about which there is a lot of controversy, and very sadly so. Shul Chayazal's father-in-law is Rabbi Pinchas ben Yair, very famous rabbi in Yemenet. In the Yemenet it says, Yemenet Shabbat, it says he met his son-in-law, Rabbi Pinchas ben Yair. All the commentaries say this is a simple error in print. The difference between father-in-law and son-in-law in Hebrew is one single letter. Chatno means son-in-law. Chotno is father-in-law. The vav was missing. Or you can have a cholam, a dot on top, without the vav, which would also be pronounced chotno. However, there are many people who made it the error of thinking that Rabbi Pinchas ben Yair was Rabbi Shumi Chayazal's son-in-law. This is a grievous error. It's been discussed many times, even recently, in many publications. And there are many rabbis who allow themselves to be misled. And again, I say very sadly so, because this is the only place in the Yemenah where you find the relationship with this one vav being in question, the sound, chatno or chotno. In the Zohar Kadosh, which is the origin of the life story of the Mishnah and Mechayzal, there we find in detail the story of the Mishnah and Mechayzal's being married to the daughter of Rabbi Mechaz ben Yair. There it says, Befedush, clearly black and white. It mentions there a number of times, many times, this relationship. And that's why it's very important to stress this point because undoubtedly you'll come across discussions on this topic. It is vital that we know the truth. There is no other truth but one. The truth is that Rabbi Mechaz ben Yair was the father-in-law of Rabbi Shemayi Mikhail Vitalzal, the student of Maria Kadosh, asks a question, strange contradiction, in reference to this. The Yemenah says in Chulin that Mikhail Spanyayil was very interested in Pidyon Shavuyim, raising money 
to ransom those in captivity. And the event tells us about his greatness, his miracle powers. When he was traveling once, he came to a river, and he had to get across. There was no way to go across. He commanded the river to the waters to divide. He could get across the river. And for himself, for others who were there, the event says, look how great he was. He performed the miracle of Moshe Rabbeinu. Well, Shir of 600,000 Jews who had the waters of the Red Sea divided before them, he too did it. What was his greatness? Because he never took a penny from anyone, not even from his own father. The moment that he got to his own senses, he would never have Hana'ah, any pleasure out of this world whatsoever. Now, he came to the house of Rabbeinu HaKadosh the Behuda Hanasi, the chief rabbi of the Yimera the Yimera tells about how he was very friendly with him he wanted to visit him and so on this question of Yichayim tells all brings up because Rabbeinu HaKadosh was the youngest student of Rabbi Shmuel Ben Yichayzal and he became the chief rabbi long after Rabbi Shmuel Ben Yichayzal was the stomach after he passed away and the father of Shri Yechayzal passed away before the Shri Yechayzal. Now how can we have Rabbi Chazban Yair coming to the Benai Kadosh visiting him, being apparently the same age? If he was the father of Shri Yechayzal, how could he come to the next generation as the same age as Shri Yechayzal stood? This is a mighty powerful question. It would seem impossible to answer, coincide these two. Chaimit tells our answers very simply, very simply, that Chaspin Yair, who came to the Kadosh, was the grandson of Chaspin Yair, the father of Shemir Yechayzal. Grandson named after his grandfather. There were two of them. This is the simple answer, and actually a true one. There is no other answer possible. Again, in fact, truth. Chesbe Yair was the father of Rabbi Shmuel Yechayza. The vital point to remember. True, if this question ever is brought up, you now know the answer to that question of seeming contradiction between the, the, the time element of Rabbi Shmuel Yechayza's students and the generation before him. Now, the next point which we must bring up and then go back to straighten this point out. The U.S. says Rosh Hashanah came back, he did certain things. He met his father-in-law, and his father-in-law saw his condition, he started to, he saw the wounds, the deep wounds that were inflicted by the sand, lying in sand continually, being submerged in sand up to his neck. The sand cut into his flesh. There were deep gashes, caused by the sin and his father-in-law started to brush him off to wash him and his tears his tears fell into the to these wounds and caused tears that are have acid to them caused the Mishra Yechayazal to cry out pain the husband Yair said to him woe is to me that I see you in such a condition Mishra Yechayazal answered woe is to me if you would not see me in such a condition because the fact that you see me in this condition is the reason that I have now risen to the highest possible status the greatest rabbi of the man one who was so great that all the angels in heaven called Mishmur Yechayazel rabbi too and the Avi always called him rabbi he was never called by his name except one time the Zohar Kadosh says that he heard his name being called without the word Rabbi and he said this must be Hashem calling me no one else would dare to call me by my name and of course it was after this we get to the point the Mishur Yechayazal walked out of the street and he suddenly came face to face with Yehuda Ben Gedim. Yehuda Ben Gedim had caused the entire trouble in the beginning by having this the 
words that he had spoken against the Roman government passed back to the Romans. Though he did not do it directly, he had told us to his friends and relatives, the fact that he let it out, let out a secret like this, which is so dangerous, was the direct cause of Shemini Chayazel's having to flee and stay in exile for 13 years. Shemini Chayazel saw him, he looked at him and said, you are still alive. He gave him a burning look, look of the power of a tzaddik. And this look caused Yudha Begidim to physically disintegrate. His bones fell apart. He made a heap of bones. This causes death. Now here we come to an interesting point. Tosa Foot asked the question, How is it possible that Yehuda Begidim should be killed by the Bishma Bechayzal, which means that he was evil, or at least a person not of great importance? What we find the Yemen says elsewhere that Rabbi Shmuba Yechayazal said to his son, There are two rabbis who have come here, and I want you to go visit them because they are very holy, receive their blessings. One is Rabbi Yonatan ben Asmai, the second one is Rabbi Yehuda ben Gedim. These two had come to pay their respects to the Mishra Yechayzo, and they had asked permission to leave, and they had not left, because they had not left, they, had, they were detained for a while, they came back and asked permission again. And he said to them, but you already received permission to leave, which is the custom before you leave. A tzaddik must receive permission to leave, to depart. They said, because of the fact that we were detained, we cannot leave now without permission, since we are in this vicinity. So he said, you're right, you justified that. It's admirable. Then he sent his son to them to receive a blessing. This was after being in the cave. So that you can imagine how great the Yudha Begedim was that Shuri Chayazal's son was sent to him to receive a blessing. How can we say here that Yudha Begedim was put to death by the Shuri Chayazal and he was a person of evil? Tosafot says that we must say that the look that Shuri Chayazal gave him was not one that caused him to disintegrate just that he died but then because disintegrate a, a mound of bones a heap of bones is a very derogatory statement which is said about the Sha'im when the Zedek looks at the Asha he falls into the heap of bones that shows the person was an Asha here he had inadvertently perhaps unintentionally led to the exile of Shemir Chayazel and therefore now he paid with his life but the Gemara says, tells a story, the other one, so the Gemara would not say he fell into the heap of bones, the Gemara would say he just passed away through the slum. The Mephedashim say, though, there is no doubt that we cannot change so many words in the Gemara. We do not find the word Rabbi Yudha Begidim throughout the Gemara in the story. Again, we must say, there were two people. One was Rabbi Yudha Begidim, a rabbi, who was great, famous, accepted by the Bishop of Yechayazal as a great rabbi. The other was this person, Yudha Begidim, who was no relation whatsoever. He perchance happened to have the same name. And therefore, we don't have to change the Gisa, the wording in the Gemara. He was killed by the Bishop of Yechayazal's look, in which he was, he did disintegrate into a pile of bones. These are the uh, additional points that are outstanding in the story except for the item that is brought by the Mephedashim commentaries on the Zohar HaKadosh where they ask the miracle that happened to the Mishim Yechayat when he came to this cave was that a carob tree sprang up the question is even if it was a miracle he had food now but it was a tree and he law in the Torah is any new tree that's planted planted or grows the first three years it is called Orla 
By a lot of these, the fruits are forbidden for any human to consume them. The fourth year, the fruit must be brought to the holy temple. If it cannot be brought, then it remains forbidden the fourth year too. It's only the fifth year that a Jew is allowed to eat those fruits. This law applies at all times to this very day in the Nietzsche soil if a new tree is planted and the fruits are forbidden for four years. How could the Rishim and Yechayazal have eaten from the fruit of this tree before the four years were up? Even if we say that it was through a miracle that this tree grew, it still cannot be that a miracle would allow a sin to be committed. A, a, the tree did grow. It appeared instantaneously, but still the tree was growing. And if it was growing from the moment that this tree appeared until four years have elapsed, the fruit are forbidden. There's no loophole that can circumvent this. The question, of course, is a very strong one, but there's a hidden, one of the hidden statements in the Gemara that's brought in brought in Yorah Deah. There's one case where Orla does not, does not doesn't have any effect. There's no Isur of Orla. But that is a tree that grows among stones, among rocks, not in a regular field. The tree that comes out among Salaim, rocks, that tree is exempt from the law of Orla. This carob tree appeared among the rocks. It wasn't in a field. And therefore, the, the, there was no law of Orla. The Mishri Chayzlak eat from this tree immediately. We spoke of the bat of Tefillin. Which is one of the most important mitzvot that is found in the Torah. There's one mitzvah that the Torah compares to Shabbat. Just as Shabbat is the symbol of faith in Hashem, that's on Shabbat, seventh day. Tefillin is the symbol of a person's faith in Hashem during the six days of the week. A person who does not put on Tefillin means that he is revolting against the king. The king has given him his symbol, his crown to wear, and he rejects it. That means this person is a traitor to the king. So one who does not wear tefillin is called an apikodas, and this person cannot receive olam haba, the medicine. Well, the Yemenah tells us that tefillin should be worn with a pure mind and with a clean body, pure body and mind. He better gives us an example of a man named Elisha Baal Kenafayim. Elisha, the master of wings. He better says, why was he called the master of wings? Because one time, the Roman government issued a decree that any person, any Jew who puts on tefillin on his head will have his head uh, broken or have a hole bored through his head uh, broken or have a hole bored through his head 